Thank you very much, Russell. Everyone who came, thank you to the organizers for inviting me again. It's hard to believe it's been two years since we were here. And it's a completely different topic today, but just like the topic that I first spoke about publicly at ACU, this is the first time I'm speaking, giving a public talk about this on camera. Uh, there was a small event in Denver last month. That was the very first one that was just a small group. Oh, but in this case, there's a public paper already, P709, that you might have seen. And so we're going to be trying to work further on that over the coming months, years. Like meta classes, this is, I'm going to talk about forward looking things that are long term. The question, will this be in C some number, is not applicable. It is too early for that. It is experimental. It has not yet been seen by the whole committee. So, this is an attempt to identify a problem and to start trying to look for solutions, soliciting help from many, including many in the audience have already helped. So thank you very much to this set of people, and I have probably forgotten some, who have already given me great input in private conversations, in reviews of papers. There are undoubtedly still mistakes and errors. They are mine, and we're going to keep trying to refine and correct those. To introduce the issue, here is a function that you encounter in a code review. I mostly black out the name. What would you say as somebody tries to check this into your beloved code base? Anyone shout it out? No, no. why no? That wasn't a joke, that, that wasn't a pun. <laughs> What's wrong with it? Two, Two types of error reporting. Well, isn't, if error reporting is good, some is good, more. <laughs> So this is the pick a lane problem. If you have somebody who's not in a lane, it's hard to pass them, things go wrong. The author of this function was not able to decide, make the design decision that was their responsibility of how to report an error. They're being inconsistent. Sometimes we'll throw an exception. Sometimes we'll return a status code. The author of this function didn't do their job. Now, one follow-up question, what's harder than getting your caller to do correct, decent error handling? Asking them to do it twice in different ways. <laughs> but this is our world. We live that world every day, just maybe not in the same function, because those ones hopefully get rejected from code reviews. But we constantly have library A that decides to return a status code. <coughs> There's a STD colon colon error code. Standardized, you can't even call them non-standard. Let's not talk about error now until later. Library B throws an exception. Pity the poor caller that tries to use these libraries together, perhaps in a template, to call this overload set. The call will work, and if they don't write any error handling, well, I guess they don't have a problem. Well, they don't, they have other problems. Hopefully this two slide example is enough to say that this is not a world that we can tolerate, yet it is our world. A quick preview, what does the standard do? It throws exceptions, right? Unless your file system, which does both of these things in the same class, and we're about to do it again in networking if nothing changes. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time just establishing there is a problem because in this world, it has become evident that we still have socialization of the idea that there is a problem in the first place and what the root causes are that we need to do. Hopefully when I give this talk a year, three years, five years from now, I'll be able to mostly not talk about this first section except in one slide because we all agree what the problem is. But we still have disagreement about is there a problem, so let's talk about that. I'll talk about a crucial definition to me is what is a recoverable error? What is an error in the sense of something I should report to my caller? And then talk about f four coordinated proposals because the paper has four pro uh, pieces that in 709 that could be four separate papers. Normally, I encourage people to break up their papers and to have targeted papers. I don't do that here on purpose because error handling is fundamental. If you are learning a new language, one of the first things you should do is go look to see what their error handling story is, and that will tell you a lot about what it's like to code in that language. 
in five minutes, you can tell a lot about a language. Because this is fundamental, even though this does not propose any breaking changes, so if, if this sounds scary because, oh no, breaking change, I'll try to emphasize there is no breaking change being proposed anywhere here. Nevertheless, we want to look at air handling all up. I think it would be a mistake and it would lead to, to a bad outcome or a worse outcome if we try to solve this problem in isolation and look at that problem in isolation. It turns out that when you look at these four things together that I'll describe, it, you can make choices that still solve this problem, but instead of choosing option one, you use option two, which doesn't interfere with this other one over here, and they work together much better when you look at error handling as a whole because it's fundamental in any language. So let's talk about that there is a problem. I, I ran the survey, this, uh, this question on purpose, in the survey last February, so a year ago, and in the question, are exceptions allowed in your current project? 3,000 people answered. The answers were 52% said, no, they're not allowed in all or in part of their project. Why does this matter? This matters because it means they are not using standard C++. And let's be clear, this is not an ideological statement. It is very easy for us programmers to get emotional and have ideology and it's like, oh no, that can't be true because I believe why. That's a factual statement, I, I think, unless I'm fooling myself, because standard C++ requires exceptions. You cannot do error handling with the STL, with the exception of some file system calls, without using exceptions. You cannot have constructors that fail unless they throw an exception. There's no place to return a status code unless you use error no and no, don't do that. That has other problems. You cannot use operator overloading in C++. That means that hello world doesn't work if you turn off exception handling. Because I can't see out shift shift hello. Why? Especially if I do std string hello and see out that. Now I'm using constructors and overloaded operators. I can't do error handling. I can't even do hello world in this dialect. Instead of constructors in these worlds, and, and many of you have worked in these worlds, and you know you tend to use factories instead of constructors, and guaranteed copy elision is your friend there, but it's still an idiom that is not standard. It's not what the standard library uses. And you're not using the standard library, hardly or at all. And there's various ways through this, uh, various alternatives. Now, one of these, the questions I got about this, and this is because like, there are some people who really do believe that, well, I don't think there really is a problem because I don't really talk to the people who, who have this problem, or I think maybe they're just doing it wrong, or implementers should be better. And you start to see that, that reactionariness when they ask questions like, and this is an actual question I got from a senior standards committee person, well, is that N really representative? I mean, there's five and a half million C++ developers. That's not probably not really enough to get a real sense that this is a true answer. So any stats nerds is 3,000 sample size pretty, uh, a pretty good number or a pretty bad number for a five and a half million developer population? How many for, yeah, pretty good number, quite a few hands. How many for, that's a pretty bad number. Uh, ah, so, so the question is, it wasn't randomly chosen. So first of all, it's an excellent number, which makes up for the fact that it's not randomly chosen. And second, it was randomly chosen in the sense that it was not sent to a particular audience. It was broadcast on the isocpp.org website. Yes, there is a self-selected audience there but it is a very diverse audience. Nevertheless, the end being so large, and this is huge, should make up for that sample set distortion. Let me further demonstrate that. If you look at United States national political polls, which are known to be reliable and consistent, 538 uses them. One in 200,000 is a good sample size. And of course, there they make sure they actually are random. This is one in 1,700. So it's about two orders of magnitude larger sample size. I did the survey again in uh, five months later. 
it was sent to a different audience through different channels. It has a different N. And if you didn't notice that I advanced the slide, it's because the numbers are so bloody consistent. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that in UK? Oh, that means something different here. Never mind. <laughs> now, I did the survey again as many of you were walking in. So I believe 81 of you participated in the survey. And so we have that is a small sample size, and you are pretty self-selected, but we still see there's a significant number of you who say that, no, we can't use exceptions either, and you're one in 68,000, those of you who answered, of developers worldwide. Let's look at that same data a different way. If you actually go and look at exceptions, error codes, and expected outcome-like types, and you say, no, they're not allowed, they're allowed in some parts, yes, they're allowed openly. One of the first things you notice is that error codes of the three have the strongest support. They have the weakest banning and the strongest allowed, which is interesting. The second interesting thing is expected outcome types are allowed everywhere almost the same as exceptions are, and they're totally non-standard. And yet they're allowed as pervasively as exceptions. And finally, every method is banned outright in more than 10% of projects, and that is a smoking gun for, to measure fragmentation of the community. That is a smoking gun. Every method is banned outright in at least 10%, and in the case of exceptions, expected outcome, 20 and 30% of projects. Totally, you can't even use it anywhere in the project. The numbers here today are very similar. Oh, in the Microsoft, sorry, also in the Microsoft survey, notice the numbers are very similar, and here today, they're very similar as well with n equals 81. So thank you for participating in the survey. It is remarkable how consistent these results are. If nothing else, I hope I will never need to show these slides again to establish the problem. Hopefully we've got this on camera, thank you ACCU, and hopefully we never need to talk about this again. So let's move on. So the problem is that standard C++ and the rest of the C++ community is fractured into dialects. Some of us use the standard language, and those of us who turn off exceptions are not using the standard language for the reasons that we've discussed. But this is the idealized simple view. The reality is much messier, and it's worse than this, because this is only showing some of the popular, idea, the popular systems, and we keep inventing more. And this doesn't count all the ones you did homebrew, like the, the EASTL, which is popular and used, or the thing you did in your company, because they exist. It's been reinvented all over the place. Which of these, again, the stood file system use? More than one, which is already a poor answer. A funny thing happened to me on the way to breakfast. Uh, uh, Bjorn, are you here? Wait, ah, thank you. Please tell me if I'm misrepresenting our conversation. So we met in the elevator, fairly random. So we sat down, and over breakfast, I'd like you to read a, a brief summary of our conversation. Please read. So I said, cool, took a sip of coffee, thought of a, a follow-up question, because I wanted to make sure I did not ask any leading questions. <laughs> and still in the spirit of not adding leading questions, you get this answer all the time. This is textbook. This one just happened to be a couple of hours ago. So what's the root cause? There are only two language features in C++ that violate the zero overhead principle. Now, remember, zero overhead doesn't mean it costs nothing. Zero overhead means you don't pay for it if you don't use it. And when you do use it, part two, you couldn't reasonably write it more efficiently by hand. That's what zero overhead means in, in the C++ principle that Bjarne uh, articulated. So you have people who say, I can't afford to even enable exception handling on my project because just turning it on incurs overhead without throwing a thing. I haven't used the feature, but there's overhead. That violates the first part of the zero overhead principle. Those who turn it on may say, but I can't afford to throw an exception. So in real-time code, for example, 
you can, if you return an error code, there are tools that know for error codes exactly how long a call tree could possibly run and could put an, statically put an upper bound on how long it may take to return success or error. Those tools still do not exist for exception handling, because, so it's statically unboundable how expensive it will be to report an error with an exception, which means I can't use those in real-time systems, not hard real-time systems. And secondly, the same applies to the space used, because the exceptions must be dynamically allocated. And so the space used is also, so even if I'm not in a real-time system, if I have bounded space, my call tree must use no more than this space. Error codes, I can compute that. Exceptions, I can't, because they're dynamic, because of their nature. And also, throwing an exception is usually less efficient than doing it by hand, which is why people keep reinventing uh, Boost Outcome, which is a wonderful project that required enormous ingenuity for Nile to build and much community input. Boost Expected, which is now being proposed for standardization, all of these things, because they're all faster than exceptions. Exceptions don't meet the zero overhead principle because when I do use them, I can do better by hand. Yes, I can. I can do no allocation and no RTTI on the catch side. And later, we'll talk about a bonus problem, the question of I can't throw through particular code. So those are the three symptoms just to try to establish the problem and to identify that the root cause is that we love C++'s zero overhead principle. Most of us use C++, at least in part, because of the control it gives us and the zero overheadness and we regularly turn off the two language features, exceptions and RTTI, that violate them. That's not inconsistent. It's because we, for the same reasons we love C++ and the language itself violates those in those two places. Before I continue to the proposals, let's just talk briefly about a pivotal definition, because this is really important. What is a recoverable error? That is something I should report to my caller as a condition that the program programmatically could recover from. Many good dictionary definitions exist. Let's use Merriam-Webster. An error is an act that fails to achieve what could be done, what should be done, and that's great. So let's from now on, or at least for this talk, I'm going to use the term error to mean a recoverable error that says a function could not do what it advertised. You met its preconditions, so it had a sane starting point, it had, it had a chance to do the right thing. It encountered some problem, maybe a database didn't, couldn't be found or a network connection was gone or who knows what. It encountered some problem where it couldn't achieve its success post conditions and the calling cold code can be told and the code can recover. It's something that the, the calling code's author the code, not the human being, can do something about. My thesis is only these should be reported to calling code as errors. And I don't care if at this, for this definition if you use exceptions or error codes or boost outcome. This applies to any mechanism you might use to report the error to calling code. Prefer exceptions, well, that's where we're going to end up, but this applies, this is independent of that. This is true in every single language on the planet and has been rediscovered over and over again. So here's an example of something that is not a recoverable error. Stack overflow, abstract machine exhaustion. The C++ abstract machine simply could not execute your program. Right? So over, stack, overflowing a stack should not be reported as an exception. If it was, forget no accept, because any function call could overflow stack, right? So like, there would not be no accept. Suddenly, every function could throw. And it's just, today, we have only 90% of functions that can throw. We'll talk about that in a moment. But clearly, stack exhaustion, abstract machine exhaustion, is not something that the calling code could do something about. You may not even be able to get back to the calling code. The system is probably corrupted in some way, even if you could. So it would be an error to report that as an error to calling code. A programming bug, including a precondition violation, also is not something that calling code can typically recover from. Now, sometimes you do want to run in a mode where you log and continue, because it turns out that programs can stumble along, and sometimes degraded performance is okay. You still have to test for that. In principle, though, as soon as you have a precondition violation or a postcondition violation uh, for, for success, 
uh, or a failed assertion, by definition, if you're using these things correctly, your program is now in a state it was never designed to handle. And that statement itself is enough to say, I'm in a state the program doesn't know what to do with, cannot recover from, because it wasn't designed for that. There could be macro ways to recover by dumping parts of a process, some isolated component, or stumbling along, throwing away a partial result. But in general, these programming bugs should not be reported to the caller because by definition, it's something the caller can't programmatically do something with. So here's the taxonomy so far. Corruption of the abstract machine should terminate. In fact, you don't get much choice. It pretty much must. You can set terminate handler to do some last ditch things, but basically you're done. But you report it to a human being, the sysop. A programming bug, the proper thing to use is assertions or log checks or contracts, that kind of thing. Again, the person you're reporting it to is a human being, the programmer. You're putting it in a log file so a programmer can do something about the bug. Programs do not fix themselves as much as we would like them to. Not even with AI yet. And then we have a recoverable error, say host not found or something there, you know, throw an exception, error code, whatever. But the key thing is you're reporting to a different species. You are reporting to code. Code that was told this might happen and is expected to have a program, have code to do something in that case. With that in mind, that we have this problem, that we're going to define what an error is, let's go to the four parts of this coordinated proposal. Again, I may be wrong about some of these, and this is a work in progress that will continue. I feel pretty confident about it, which is why I'm here today. And thank you again to everybody who's given their input so far. The first is, exception handling is not zero overhead. Without making a breaking change, no breaking changes, because we can't tolerate that, what would it take to let you opt into a zero overhead? exception model. So today's exception model you can pretty much summarize as I've got to throw an object of a dynamic type which requires a dynamic allocation and essentially I'm throwing in any every time. I'm throwing a type erased object because I allocate it on the heap and here you go. What do you do with the catch site? Catch my exception reference. What do you got to do? RTTI. Is this void star that? A that. Is this void star of the other. And so I've got to do RTTI at every catch handler. This is because of the type erasure. That's one way to think about it. So the proposal is, well, what if we threw a value of a statically known type that can represent all kinds of errors, such as an evolution of the stood error code that we already have, a minor evolution of that. It exists today. It can represent every error in POSIX, Windows. It can wrap an exception pointer. It can represent anything in two words. And it's cheap to copy, trivially. And we can make it even better than that, trivially relocatable. And we catch them by value. No allocation to throw, whereas today you must allocate. You must do dynamic allocation to throw even an int and catch by value, no RTTI, whereas today you must do RTTI on every catch handler. That's the basic difference. There's other benefits, including that we can share the return channel, including these can be returned in registers. They don't even have to occupy any memory space at all. This is the kind of thing we need to prove out with prototyping, which I hope to begin in the next year. We'll see, because these claims require validation. But we have done things by hand that are the equivalent today like boost outcome and expected that have worked very well. So think of it as baking that into the language. So because the model is going to be, the proposal is that a function can opt into this mode, that's where there's no breaking change here. So what does it look like? If you say throws on a function, it's as if you return a union of your success type and a std error type, and a bool. Uh, the bool doesn't even have to be in a register. It can be in an unused CPU flag for extra efficiency. So it's exactly the programming model of exceptions. You try, you catch, automatic propagation. 
And it's exactly error codes implementation. So if you ever think about well, how efficient is this, think it is isomorphic to error codes. So that immediately tells you that all of those tools that know how to put a static bound on error code returning functions and how long that will take to report errors for real time code or how much space it will take for space and constrained code, all those just work. Because it's isomorphic to error codes, you're done. Everything you know about error codes works here. But the hope is because the language and the compiler know what you're doing, it can implement them better than you could implement them by hand, including that it can fold into the return channel. And instead of returning you, you know, your pair of iterators, it can return you the error, the stood error in the same registers and put the discriminant in a flag that you could not access yourself so that it actually doesn't occupy any storage at all that the program can tell. So, we have done a great job. If you look back at the greatest hits of C++ 11, 14, 17, and now 20, every single one of them that has been a major feature has doubled down on value semantics. For instance, even reflection, value-based rather than type-based reflection. So under the covers, instead of every time you reflect on something, we generate a new type, which doesn't scale, it's awful for performance, we make a new value. C++ is a language about values. That's our value. <laughs> so philosophically, this is in the spirit of other success stories. The same thing with move semantics. Move semantics was all about providing ways, better ways to talk about value semantics. Now, if you love exceptions and this worries you, I can say, this is great. This just helps more people do the right thing. They're going to use exceptions too. They can afford them now. So if you love exceptions, I'm your friend. This is, this is good. We're going to convert the world. If you love expected outcome, it's like, guess what? We're taking them over. We're making the expected outcome into the compiler. That's really what this does. Oh, but by the way, you know how in, with expected outcome, you have to propagate them manually still? You get the automatic propagation. Isn't that great? <clears throat> For people who love error codes, so, yes, you know, you know, error codes are great. This is again baking those into the language. But you know, when you when you return an error code right now, you can't return a success result either, unless you make a union. If you return an error code, you have to return a success result in like out parameters or something. With this, you could just return your result normally, and we fold the error code in and share the return channel, so we can do it better than your it's error codes, but better. And each of these audiences has values. They, the thing that they know is valuable, and we are taking the best of all of these. So the summary is that if I write throws, so the, the try and catch are today's code, but if I write throws on a function, the idea is I opt into saying, ah, this function emits these lightweight exceptions. They ret f returns as if a union of string comma stood error with a discriminant in a carry bit or something like that. But if I do a regular dynamic throw or I call other code that throws, that's fine. That's, that still works. If I get a dynamic exception, one of today's exceptions coming through, I wrap it in an exception putter. It turns out std error can wrap those. std error code can already wrap those. And then we just transport it. So you still got the dynamic allocation. But once you switch to this model, we are adding no further overhead than what you already were got from using the old model. And it's fully compatible. And you can go the other way, too. And you can still do try and catch. But now you can catch by value and inspect values. So these are always or allocated as an ordinary stack value, unless you're wrapping a dynamic exception from today from lower code. We share the return channel. We always know the static type, so we never need RTTI. We just inspect its value to, to find out what it is. No extra static overhead in the binary image. You don't pay anything if you just for turning it on. No dynamic allocation to throw, RTTI to catch. And deterministic for space and time to report exceptions just like error codes. As a summary, if you think of today's model, today's model is when I throw, I basically allocate and type erase an exception. And then when I catch, I say, are you one of these? And I have to do a special dynamic cast. It's not like the dynamic casts in the language. It's a special one because it goes from void star to, conceptually, to a base star. 
Here, you return, the model is you return a value, a small two-word value, and you look at the value and just do, just look at the, uh, do an equals comparison. So what are the benefits? Someone named Marshall, I think it was, asked me before the talk started, so is this like Metaclass? Is this, is this an, a, another, another, uh, what was the word you used? I don't think it was me. Oh, it was like, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was, but it was an, an, like another scheme or another idea. No, it's the same idea. Agenda. A, a different agenda. A different agenda. No, it's the same agenda. I have one agenda these days, and I've said it out loud for the last couple of years at all my CPP con talks and elsewhere. I think the only thing worth doing to C++ as major language evolution now is to simplify it. I think that's the only thing worth doing. Now. Herb, you said, said simplify, and you want to add this big reflection meta classes feature. <laughs> yes, so code is simpler. And I can re replace many language proposals with libraries and write them as libraries instead. So yes, you find, like, what is the key, the lever? Is there a lever we can add that can make our code simpler and replace many things that would otherwise be language features and let them be libraries, because that's what we are, a library language. This also is about simplifying, because today, the fact that we are fractured like this is a source of great complexity. It's invading our standard file system, soon networking. If we do nothing, we're just going to keep proliferating error codes, because even the committee can't decide on one, for valid reasons today. Unless we fix the root cause, that is only going to continue. And we're going to be standardizing stood expected and doing other things. So what are the benefits? My first goal is that every C++ project in the world should have no technical reason to turn off exception handling. There should be no technical reason to disable exception handling. Just turning it on should have no impact on the size of the executable, if you don't use it. That's the zero overhead principle part one. Second, I would like to enable a world where code has no valid technical reason, such as have a static upper bound on the space or the time of execution to not report an error by an exception. If they still prefer error codes for other reasons, house style, whatever, we're a polyglot language. But today we're forcing people to do that who don't want to but have to. There should be no valid technical reason not to use exceptions. And if we have that, then we could get into a world where it's easier to teach C++ because now I could teach every function should be exactly one of no accept or throws. And then the standard library can still do things like conditional no accept if it wants to. But the idea is I'm either, I either throw or I don't. And if you'll notice, mother, other modern languages have come to the same conclusion about what good modern error handling looks like. This is not a new invention for C++. So that's the first thing. The second and third things are to throw fewer exceptions. Um, this has been, again, rediscovered in many, many languages. Here's a quote from Joe Duffy, who was working on a project called Midori, which was an evolution of C Sharp for systems programming, and a very wise language designer. One of the things he noticed, and so did have the .NET architects, the Java architects, once you have contracts, so this is one reason I'm so glad we're getting them in C++20, something like 90% of all exceptions thrown in like major frameworks, .NET frameworks, Java uh, cl common classes, become preconditions. Argument null exceptions, argument out of range exceptions, those should be preconditions not throw in exceptions, because they're programming bugs. Who do you report programming bugs to, the code or the human who can fix the bug? So that's the idea. And this has been many times reinvented and rediscovered. So if we say that bugs should be reported as contracts, and I'll take some questions at the end, but I, I see some hands. Or, or are you just leaning against the wall? OK. Uh, Precondition violations are bugs, so we should report them to the human, the programmer, at test time. Calling code typically can't recover programmatically, although you might have a mode where you ignore them, like we turn off our asserts and stumble along. But we should be using assertions, contracts, and those things. 
instead for these. In WG21, I have not yet had a chance to, to show much of this proposal to the whole committee. I've deliberately held back the language part we just talked about from getting to Evolution Working Group. It's been seen by SG14, but not EWG, because we've been focused on C20, so I've been deliberately holding that back as to not even try to distract the committee from that. Now that we think that we've, we have finished the, approving the feature set in EWG, I'll probably bring it to our next meeting in Cologne. However, last year I already brought it to the library side of the committee who basically said, yeah, that's what we already have been planning to do, is to take all those precondition violations, pretty much every use of stood logic error that really was being used as a precondition. Turns out there were a few things that weren't really preconditioned, so this helps clean that up too. Most of them were and to migrate them to something else, to a specification that can be implementation defined, potentially to contracts in the future. There'd be a release migration period. But the library side of the standards committee, it turns out is pushing, you're pushing against an open door. They already know. In fact, when I showed this to them, the vote was unanimous to do this. And they pointed out, they pointed to two meetings ago where they already took the same vote on a different paper. So thank you. It's always nice to know you're copying. Here is a, a, a YouTube grab from somebody who had made a Space Oddity song. It, it was kind of cute. It was in Stephen Hawking's voice, recorded voice. So you can find it on YouTube, but I just enjoyed the picture. Uh, anything odd about this picture? <laughs> you wouldn't believe me if I told you this was Apollo 18, for multiple reasons. Yeah, does that, that guitar make sense? No. That's what I thought too. Turns out people can make arguments that that guitar makes sense because it's in contact with the suit so he can hear it. It would be definitely oddity if there was an audience around. Note, I have not personally tried to play a guitar in a vacuum in a space suit, so I'm only conjecturing here. But it's like there are things that are odd in programming. Like you go and you look and you know this code is odd. We know that's odd. But people will defend it. Yeah, but you know, he could probably hear it through the spacesuit. People defend the oddities in their code. Here's an oddity, and notice they're numbered oddly. Today, it is a fact that exceptions must be dynamically allocated. You throw it in, you better allocate it on the heap. The system has no choice. Yes, some systems play games. It is still effectively as if a heap allocation. It is not a normal stack allocation. It is dynamic. Fun fact number two, or three, dynamic allocation failures are reported using exceptions. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> this is why GCC, for example, has a separate emergency reserve area where bad alloc objects come from. Because if you try to do new int and that fails, we have to throw stud bad alloc. Think about that. That had better not try to do new stud, stud bad alloc. Otherwise, it won't ever work. So, We've already talked about how exceptions should not need to be dynamically allocated. But separately from that, should allocation failures be reported as program recoverable errors? So this is thinking in progress. But I want to show two endpoints where I think it's pretty clear the answer is no, and here the answer is yes. And we're still figuring out what are the patterns in between. But for now, even if we get, a, get rid of the, uh, the need to dynamically allocate exceptions, we still have this issue with allocation failures. If I hit Stack Overflow, can I continue running ordinary code? No. We're in UB land. We've exhausted, we've corrupted the abstract machine. If I hit a memory allocation failure, can I continue running ordinary code? Maybe. No, if it's a small allocation failure. And I'll, here's the reason why. If you try to report an error, and I don't care if it's by throwing an exception or returning an error code. If you try to report an error, what's the first thing you're going to do? Unwinding. What does unwinding run? Ordinary code. It's, it runs plain vanilla code. Ordinary code allocates. It just does. It may not allocate that time, it may not allocate the next time, but ordinary code allocates. And if I could not do new int, I should seriously question whether I am able to continue executing code normally, whether I'm already corrupted. So certainly for a, a tiny allocation, 
I think there's a strong argument to be made that at that point, you cannot continue running ordinary code. Our industry is full of examples of code that thinks it's resilient to bad alloc. And literally 99 times out of 100 when it's audited, they realize that code has never been executed and doesn't work. You have to write code very carefully to be OOM resilient. It requires a careful kind of coding. It is not running normal code. Now, having said that, some code is OOM safe, and we don't want to lose that. So let's look at case one. I allocate a big buffer, or I have an opt-in allocator, not the default allocator, and I try to do some big new. Well, just because new a million ints fails does not mean I can't continue executing normal code. Right? So the argument of, OK, I'm already corrupted, I've, I've exhausted the abstract machine, does not apply here. So throwing an exception, returning a status code, should be fine for these cases, because I can still run normal code. And I think that's the litmus test to look for, it seems, is can I, have I exhausted the abstract machine, or can I continue running normal code? But man, if new int failed, I'm in trouble. I may not be able to unwind. Some systems are able to because they're unwind strictly lets go of stuff because they were careful or lucky. But in general, the conjecture here, and we'll continue validating this, is that throwing or returning is not OK. So one of the interesting things when I presented this to LEWG in a, t a couple of meetings ago last summer um, in Rapperswil, I think it was. Was it Rapperswil last summer? Yeah. Yes. They, they all merged together. Which Rapperswil? Rapperswil 3, I think that was. I, pr I mentioned that it, the, that group was unanimously, the library side of the house was unanimously in favor of, yes, let's migrate preconditions away from exceptions to something else, contracts, assertions, something else. But not exceptions, not that. We've already decided that. Great. Then I pulled this after presenting it, and it was unanimous in LEWG, the Library Evolution Working Group. It was unanimous that, yes, we would like allocations. Like, I didn't even distinguish big and small at that point. We would like allocations to fail fast by default, which as soon as the language folks heard about this, there was, there was some fear and terror. But so this is, needs to work its way through the committee. We need to understand better what are the places where it is appropriate to report an error versus it's not. But certainly new int is problematic. And so there was a unanimous vote that, yes, we are interested in pursuing a, an allocation-free version, or at least a uh, allocations fail version of the STL, whether that's possible as an evolutionary change is another doubt. You have to plummet through the allocator, and you may need uh, new f functions like try pushback, for example, that can return whether you succeeded or not, and um safe code would use the try functions, that kind of idea. That still has to be fleshed out. But the most interesting comment to me was <laughs> when that vote was taken, because this, this is not non-controversial, when that vote was taken, which, by the way, could be done in, uh, arguably in a non-breaking way because most code that would, that would notice the difference is already broken. Also, if the, if the change to the language were to change the default new handler to terminate instead of throw, instead of throw about Alec, you can easily get back the current behavior with one line of code in your application to install a new handler that throws about Alec. You can do it in one line with a lambda. And it's in the paper, too. So it's not that we're not trying to tear down the world or have this scary breaking change. But I was surprised at how willing the library group was to consider this. This may be worrying some of you who are, who are in library related. So talk to your friends. Uh, look at the wiki notes. But it was interesting. Two things happened after that vote. When that vote was unanimously in favor of terminating fail fast on allocation failure in the standard library as a general principle, the room was silent. Then Eric Niebler said out loud what was in my head, which was, holy crap. And Walter Brown turned around, smiled, and said, we've been laying the groundwork for all of this, the contracts, the OOM, for many years. So this is something where we're still learning as a group. There is still knowledge percolating. But this is compatible with courses that the Standards Committee is already pursuing in the library, which is interesting. And there's details to flush out. And we need to make, be very careful not to make mistakes. But it was interesting to that was the feedback. So there's a summary of that. And the way this goes into the taxonomy is 
whatever heap exhaustion it makes sense to say is corruption of the abstract machine falls in this bucket, report it to a human being, you can't continue. If there are things like large allocation failures that don't mean you've exhausted the abstract machine, hey, that's a recoverable error. So now the question is just distinguishing, perhaps it's as simple as this is the default allocator and this is non-default allocators like new no throw. Could be something like that. But we're going to continue working on that. What are the benefits? Well, one is correctness because exceptions are just the wrong tool to report non-errors like preconditions and abstract machine failure. And as it turns out, new int. I think it's clear that should not be reported as an error. New no throw int, where one of the valid outcomes is couldn't do it, that's great. That wouldn't be an error. That would be a, a wide return contract. If we actually didn't throw exceptions for contract violations and for most memory failures, we would actually eliminate something like 95% of functions and the vast majority of the standard library, possibly with the exception of the containers, could be no accept, which has performance benefits. If I have one brief moment, I'll show you, because God, it's hard to have a talk without Godbolt these days. So here is Godbolt clang trunk and I have, on the left-hand side, I have a, a noaccept function. Notice that f just manipulates ints and returns them, and it calls one out-of-line function. I was having a discussion with someone, a prominent standards committee member, just this week, last couple of days, saying, well, do compilers really optimize if you write noaccept? Well, if the function I'm calling g is not no accept, notice I'm still putting in the, the calls to terminate because the no accept on f is required to, if, to terminate if there is an exception. So you need to do the machinery to implement that. Clang does. I think GCC has a bug they don't implement at all, which is OK. That's what Visual C++ did for a long time for throw paren paren, which is another story. Back to the main point here, what happens, what do you think will happen if I turn, if I get rid of those two slash slash comments? Any guesses? Code gets much shorter. shorter. How much shorter, Marshall? <laughs> <laughs> A lot. Yep. Notice this is O0. Even at O0, Clang does this. Did you notice that up there? Now let's go back and have some fun by going to, what's a good number for O? Do people normally run O2? Yeah, let's not go all the way to three. So there's call, there's call terminate. And if I do no accept here, there are performance reasons to use no accept. It is not just, it is not just a, an ideological, wouldn't the world be nice if most functions didn't throw? No, it's the world would be demonstrably fast on today's compilers already if most of the world didn't throw. Furthermore, by the way, this has also been rediscovered in many languages. Furthermore, it would enable the same percentage of the exceptional, i.e. invisible, control paths in user code. And that is probably the biggest advantage. I wrote a Guru of the Week like 25 years ago. It's time flies. Look up Guru of the Week number 20. Four line function that includes the declaration. Four line function. Three normal visible control flow paths. 20 invisible exceptional control flow paths because almost any function can throw. Most of which are nearly not nearly never executed. They don't need to be. This is before no accept was a thing, and we didn't have the right th thing to do throws properly, because it was still the, the, whole, the whole old throw specifier version back then. If we can get rid of these, our optimizers will love us. Our code reviewers will love us. We'll have fewer bugs. Code will be easier to reason about. And exception safety will probably be a lot less scary than it is for people today. Finally. Let's talk about the fourth part of the proposal, explicit try. And again, this is a separable part of the proposal. This is actually enabled largely by the last two things we saw. Because this has value on its own today, 
if this were the only thing we did to today's C++, you could do this just this thing on its own. But it's really valuable in coordination with the other three because especially those last two, if we actually could make most functions not, no accept, because most functions don't fail. They don't try to open a network socket or something. If we really could make most functions no accept, then this could be used all over the place without being noisy. Whereas today, there is no way you would write try on every expression that could throw because it's left with us, nearly all of them. That would be too much noise. So the idea here is we like that exceptions propagate automatically. Even the folks that use outcome unexpected will generally admit, even if privately or over a beer, that yeah, it can be kind of a pain that you always have to remember to propagate it by hand, return error code. It's like return error code, return error code. But as soon as you tell those people, ah, We'll make it be like exceptions, like the part one of the solution, which is the static exceptions, the lightweight exceptions. They'll say, yeah, yes, and I hear this all the time. They'll say, yeah, but it's still automatic. It's still, I don't like that. And you say, well, wait, wait, hold on, time out. Do you not like about today that exception propagation is automatic? You mean you like writing the return outcome, return outcome, return outcome? Or is it that it's invisible? They say, yeah, that. I actually wish I didn't have to write that. I'd actually love it if it propagated automatically. But I don't like that it's invisible and I can't reason about my code. And that is a legitimate point of view that has been ignored by this community. The, many people in the standards committee who know the value of exceptions make the mistake, and I have made this mistake in the past, of saying, yes, but that automatic invisible propagation is good for you. There must be something wrong with you. You just need to learn better to like it. I, I'm, I am hardly inventing even the exact words. But let's distinguish between automatic propagation that pretty much everybody agrees is motherhood and apple pie, and the invisible, and let's recognize the invisible propagation as a real problem for understanding code. The proposal is that you could write try, can, because non-breaking change, that you be able to write try on every expression or statement where some sub-expression could throw. Clearly today, where that's 95% of code, it's not something you can mandate. Because that'd be like highlighting, you know, if somebody takes a highlighter, you look at their textbook, and they've highlighted every word on the page, nothing stands out. That's, it would be too noisy, too useless. It starts to get a lot more interesting if most functions are no except. And you can see it becomes visual where the control flow paths. You can also, if we did require it in new code, for example, new code that calls throws functions, the new kind, if they succeed, which don't exist today. That's new code, so it's not a breaking change. We could even require it for new code. If we did, then we could start giving some compile time guarantees, like that if you don't see throw, that you're by default no except, things like that. So here's the idea that I could say, try on expressions. You can also find something. This is a straw man syntax to show that, yes, there would be a way to do it on variable declarations and return statements, too. But the idea is I could write try without catch, necessarily, to signal I can grep for this and know here are the points that can throw. What are the benefits? I hopefully get the best of both worlds. Keep automatic exception propagation, but now make it visible while still convenient. And it sets the stage down the road, maybe 10 years from now, maybe more, of a potential new world. With part one, if we can get to a world where we can declare every function in new code as either throws or no accept, and then do number two and number three, replace, replace preconditions and, and most oom um, instead of exceptions with contracts or fail fast or, or handlers, so they don't throw, so that 95% of functions are no accept. And we can then in new code have, you know, have a slash require try mode where I require try in new code. Now I can take C code into my C++ project, and the moment I try to compile it, it will tell me every place I should be concerned about an exception going through that exception fragile code. And there won't be very many of them. You could even have a clang tidy rule that inserts the tries for you, and you just code review them. And now you can know instead of guess and with, with fear, can I, is it safe to put the C code in my C++ project? You can mechanically find the answer to that. 
It would be great if we could do half of the things I've talked about, and I would consider that a success. If we can do all of them, the world changes in what I think is a good way. So defragmenting C++, we have a problem, but we're working on solutions. None of this is short-term. This is long-term thinking, and thank you to many for helping. And I think we have time for a couple of questions, and then I have a public service announcement. Don't let me forget that. Yes, question here. I think they throw things at you. Marshall, over to your left here, in the back. Or whoever gets it first, it's a race condition. <laughs> Go ahead, Alan. OK, I you've think. repeatedly said, in new code, in new code, in new code. Has any thought been given to migrating contemporary C++ code? Yes, uh, so I guess I don't need to repeat the question. Thank you for the microphones. Uh, there are several ways we could migrate existing C++ code. For example, uh, this is designed so that you say throws on a function to opt into this, this uh, basically an extended ABI, this, this new mode of throwing exceptions, to not make an ABI break. I have already heard from some companies who control their own code base and don't care about changing the ABI and could simply use that as the representation for normal exception handling and immediately get the no allocation, no RTTI benefits, even for today's exception handling. That's a special case, but it, it, gives us, it gives you sort of an idea where most of the concern about not breaking existing code was to make sure it stays source and ABI, source and binary compatible, because we believe in that strongly. If you're in an environment where you can relax those, there are ways of taking even more advantage of this. Is the question, so, so the first part of the proposal is a throws keyword. If you do that, it returns a stood error or a union of whatever stood error. And you, I think you're asking, would it make sense to have the throws keyword without the stood error type? I th no, because it's, in, it's integral. It, it's, that's a part of the language support library for this new feature. Like it's, it is the language support library for, for this new feature because throws would imply uh, the stood error. You could imagine like a throws with parens and have your own type there. We did consider that because Studera can represent anything, we didn't consider that extensibility as necessary yet. I was discussing over breakfast um, with Bill um, the potential for, uh, sorry, um, the potential for perhaps old exceptions to possibly still be necessary in some cases. Uh, for example, just like we don't we use unique pointer for almost everything now, we don't use naked new and naked delete. Um, is that is there going to be a similar analogy with the uh, with what you're proposing now for exceptions, or is it just going to be a case of we only have these uh, these new exceptions in uh, in code altogether? Well, C plus plus always has a backward compatibility story. So as long as code exists, which will be for the rest of our careers, that uses today's exceptions, the code that exists today. It will have to compile in some way. But just like we have been doing, say, with override, final, we can say for new code, use this. Or use equals delete instead of hiding your, uh, making private and undefined your constructor and copy operator, that kind of thing. Um, so we still have this nice backward compatibility story. Wouldn't it be nice if someday we could have a talk about if we could make backward compatibility optional? Mm, maybe sometime in the next five years, we can have that talk. <laughs> I can catch. Uh, if we're thinking about uh, Windows specifically, how does uh, structured exception handling fit into this story? <laughs> I, structured exce structured exception. <laughs> so S SEH is totally a thing. If this goes somewhere, it'll be my team also implementing it, and they will care about that question. We should not compromise the design of C for non standard exceptions. So I think we it looks like we have time for maybe one I or two think, more. I think we've got two more. Two more, okay, last two. So I think you hit the nail on the head with the automatic versus invisible propagation. But one of the other reasons why many people, me included, don't like exceptions 
is that as part of the signature, if you use something like expected or even variant, you see exactly all the failure cases. And in this case, you're using something like STD error, which puts them all together. So that wouldn't satisfy me. I would still like to see for some particular functions what all the possible failure cases are. Yeah, so certainly throws tells you this can fail. Um, so you're saying perhaps there's some way of being more fine-grained about that. Possibly, like throws this, this, this. Be very careful. Every language, including C++ that tried that, has failed. Because, because that's a composability trap. Because what if you call something else? Now, you have to basically union up. So every, every time that's been tried, it's certainly feasible. I'm not saying not to do it. Every single time that's been tried, what happens in the real world is users write, throws anything, and it's, it's worthless, and it gets removed and told, people told not to use it. But perhaps there's a way of improving it that avoids history's problems. It would just be something to be careful for. Ah, I'm, I'm so glad you said that, because this whole, this whole notion of exceptions are for exceptional situations is far too vague. Go back to the definition I put up. This is why I considered it a pivotal definition, I believe. An error, regardless of how you report it, is a function could not do what it advertised. Full stop. What should you throw exceptions for? Errors. What should you return error codes for? Errors. That is much crisper than could not achieve success post conditions is so much crisper than for exceptional situations. You know? And I'm not mocking you. I'm mocking all of us in the past who have said that. We've got away with vagueness. Time not to get away with vagueness anymore. So I, I would say that uh, if I understood what you said correctly, all of the things that you just described are, in fact, errors. If it's, not, if, if it's a failure to achieve a success post condition, they should all be reported consistently. If it is part of a success post condition, then of course it's not an error. And you're right, we shouldn't be using exceptions or error codes. But thank you very much. I do have, I do have a public service announcement afterward. I'm sure that, uh, actually, why don't we do the public service announcement okay. immediately? Public service announcement. This hotel has elevators. Well, it has elevator. <laughs> So you know how you know how this one doesn't work? And this one works? And this one doesn't work? Did you read carefully the second paragraph of this note that says you're allowed to use the fourth elevator? How many of you didn't know there was a fourth elevator? All right. Here's where it is. In fact, it's on the screen. Thank you, Marshall, for pointing it out, because I was standing in front of it when he had pointed me at it, and I could not see it. He is standing in front of it. Do you see the elevator? <laughs> there, that is a door. That is a door. We are allowed to use the staff elevator. You push through what looks like a wall. It's a very Harry Potter-esque. Nine and three quarters. <laughs> there is a second elevator. It has been faster. I'll bet now it's not. But, you know, load balancing. Thank you. And Thank I you very on, much. I think on that uh, note, uh, I'm sure there are hundreds of more questions that uh, people have on that presentation. Um, but time is as it is. Uh, I'm sure Herb is going to be around, and you're going to hassle him with those questions, and he'll be happy to answer them. And create lots and lots of conversations. And don't forget the Pac-Man rule, so that mm -hmm. we can have people come in and out of those conversations and be um, suitably welcoming to new questions as well, uh, from new people, as well as questions from the standard group. So do remember the Pac-Man rule. And on that, please can I have us thank Herb for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thanks for having us.